shovels out, the shovels outside. <laughs> Yeah. 
Jesus the center of your life today. You got a chance every day. Every day we have a chance to make Jesus the center. And we're going to talk today about why Jesus should be the center of your life, especially now. Let's do uh, the solid rock. Let's just sing Capo One on this trip. I forgot to touch on Kathy.
Seriously, like that. Like that. Oh, okay. So I'm gonna keep. I'm gonna keep it away. Keep it away from me. Keep all technology as far away from me as possible, everybody. Oh, I'm, I'm having a cramp in my stomach. In my, <laughs> this my muscle. Anyway, praise the Lord. Thank God, everybody's here, and made it safely. Can you hear me? Um, whoa. If not, I can speak. Should I speak through this too or not? You know, I'll do both in case uh, I'm old school, so I'll just hold the microphone, too. That's good. I, I appreciate that. And, uh, you know, some of the, the simple things are the big things, right? Uh, the simple things are the deep things. What th I heard uh, a good friend of ours always said, Christians don't tell lies. They just sing them. <laughs> I give you my heart, Lord. Have, have your way. <laughs> right. Until it's not my way. And then, uh, then we'll see which way that goes. Let's pray. I need it closer. Okay. I do. I need it up a little bit. I can't tell if somebody add. Yeah, it doesn't go through here. Okay. But you should. Okay. 
I thought, I think it was when it was closer, it was more, it seemed like it was <laughs> that way. Pulling out this way? Okay. How's that? Man, I feel like I have to have, have something really important to say with all of this. Uh, there's a lot of pressure on me. But, you know, um, let's, let's pray because we're going to talk about, we're going to finish up. Because I never really got started. And again, I bit off more than I can chew, as usual. So I'm going to really need the help. And the Lord just told me, all of your notes mean nothing to me. I just want you to share your heart with the people of God because you know my son. You need to know him better, but you know him well enough to talk about him. And I'll give you, a, and he gave me a few scriptures. <sighs> Man, thank you, Lord. Can, can my wife pray me in, please? So uh, today's topic is the final of Jesus is your end time antibody against the Antichrist. There's a lot of vaccine and, and uh, pestilence talk going around. So Jesus is the inoculation that we need against what is coming. And everybody needs a big strong dose of Jesus on a daily basis. The one thing that I've, I, I think I said before was, um, you know, I realized that all of my problems as I started studying, you know, all of my problems were that I didn't make Jesus big enough in a certain area of my life. And uh, any problem I had, whether it was emotional, physical, spiritual, um, it was because I had not called on Jesus to help me in this particular area of my life. And it's, and it's a shame, and I say that with great shame, because in areas where I really called on Jesus, and I, and, and I really was desperate for him, he has never let me down. In fact, he has showed up far above anything I could have ever imagined or hoped for. I want to tell you, so I, I was thinking about making a t-shirt. I was going to have a t-shirt that just says, you need somebody worthwhile to worship. <laughs> like, you know? And that's really it. In these last days, it's the battle for your heart and soul is who's going to get the worship in the end. And it's either going to be the devil, the flesh, and the world system, or it's going to be Christ. And like, as I was praying, you know the Lord, and I shared this with Jameson yesterday. I had the pleasure of working with Jameson yesterday, which was always a great thing to work with him. Man, we go through a whole lifetime of frustrations in one day. It's incredible. But you know what? Jameson has taught, I, there's, a, there's a lesson that I've learned, is that if I'm going to go through stuff, man, is it great to go through it with a Christian, a true believer, because, you know, we never really get mad. Even when we get mad at each other, we never get mad at each other. And, and uh, where I'm strong in one area, he's, he's weak, and where he's strong, I'm weak. That's probably about 90 to 10 ratio. He's strong, I'm weak, okay? But um, in that, especially out when we do cutting trees and stuff. But, you know, it was so beautiful to, in the morning we prayed. It, it, my brother, you know, because I think he got jealous of me being able to rattle off Psalm 91. And so he memorized Psalm 91. And so on the car ride out to work yesterday at, at 630, we were both reciting Psalm 91 out loud. We're trying to beat each other, you know, on each verse, right, to show that. And you know what? What a beautiful day. We didn't get hurt. We had a great time. No, it was just we worked for 10 straight hours out in the, outside, and it was like nothing, you know. 
and we overcame a few obstacles. We had a good few good laughs. And the Lord's the Lord's is showed me something uh, that, you know, in these days, uh, we need to get close relationships, in the unity of Christ. Can I tell you what I just heard economically? Do you know that lumber costs have gone up 180 percent in one year? That the average input of a house, just to build a house, is now going up with the average amount of lumber, twenty-seven thousand dollars. Commodity prices in the corn and in the major commodities have gone up over sixty percent one year. From 1778, I think it was 1787 when we had a constitution, to 2020, there was four trillion dollars manufactured of of a money supply. In one year, the money supply is at $16 trillion one year. We're just about, this weekend, to add another $2 trillion of just printed money. It's coming. What I'm going to tell you is this house of cards is about to fall. And we have to get ready. And so the most practical thing we can do to the world is the most impractical thing. I'm going to say that again. Because what seems practical in the natural is impractical in the spiritual and vice versa. So how do you deal with the coming, you know, famine, pestilence, the, the, the riders of the, of the horses? You get on your knees and you read the Bible and you reread the Gospels and you pray to Jesus and you fellowship in the unity of the Holy Spirit and you don't worry about a thing. Because when you really have Jesus in your heart, you, it's impossible to worry. What's the worst thing that can happen to us? We get sent to Jesus earlier than we thought. That's the worst thing, right? If you really think about it, if you really believe it, it will dispel all your worry. But how can you have confidence? You have to seek Jesus diligently. He's very shrewd. I've, I found that Jesus is very shrewd. He's much better at dealing with me than I am at dealing with him. I know that sounds like an un, a, a silly statement. But I'm, I think in my mind that for a long time, even as a born-again, spiritual Christian, that sometimes I can deal with Christ. But he does not let be, he be, people deal with him. He deals with everyone. And he, and, and he always gets his way. And sometimes his way, sadly, is to give you your way. Those are the words you don't ever want to hear from the Lord God. Have it your way. I have striven with you long enough. So, um, yeah, I, just, I was like, the battle for worship is, remember, the word worship comes from worth-ship. The state of having something of worth. That's what it's all about. I don't worship uh, my old tenant, my old uh, socks, right? But I've been known to worship uh, particular pieces of jewelry because they're worth more. Do you see what I mean? And in the end time, people don't understand that, but as I've been reading the book of Revelations over and over and over, because there's a blessing to anyone who reads that book, and that's the book that is opened up in the end days. Remember, the, the angel told Daniel in chapter 12, close, seal up the book until the time of the end. Even Daniel, who was giving prophecies, didn't quite understand what he was seeing or what it meant. And the angel told him, don't, it's not for you. This time's not for you. Seal it up until the time of the end, and then they'll be opened. Well, we're seeing these things happen uh, amazingly. In fact, it's, so, it's happening so amazingly that we don't believe it's actually happening. That's the deal. And, and there's been so many false professions of the coming of Jesus, right? Every preacher who doesn't want to talk about end times uses 88 reasons for, the, for Jesus coming in 88. That was a big, huge a failure. And then all these false preachers on TV saying, the, you know, Jesus coming, meet me at this shoreline, and we're going to meet the Lord and greet. And so it's kind of like the boy who cried wolf. But the truth is, the world has changed so much in 10 years, and I say in one year, 
Do you know this is the one year anniversary where 184 countries all decided overnight, over a weekend, that they were going to restrict the movement of all of their populations. It's never happened, folks, ever. You know, I keep saying that, but I want you to understand, we're at times where it's never, ever happened before. Even 15 years ago, the prevalence of cell phones and the technology of people being able to see something all at once has never been. The amount of, uh, of uh, computing technology where literally an AI can track every single moment, movement of every single person at all time down to your molecular structure, down to your heartbeat and, your, and the, um, you know, and the uh, cholesterol in your bloodstream. It's possible now. It's all set up. So these times are not like any other. So all of those boy who cried wolf, now the wolf is here. And now people are like, he's crying. They're not coming. And the Lord asked me, he's like, you know why people aren't looking forward to Jesus coming? Because really they don't want him to come. If he came right now, they would be terrified. <gasps> he, I'm, I'm not ready. Wait, I, you can't get, wait, Jesus, wait, can you wait uh, two more years? I'll be, then I'll go back and get ready. But I have this vacation I've got planned. Oh, but I wanted to build that big house in the country. I'm not married yet. How can I, right? He's like, they really don't want me to come. It was the same way back 2,000 years ago. The prophecies were being fulfilled as Jesus walked the earth. I mean, there were literally hundreds of prophecies were being fulfilled. And they, only a few people really wanted him because they gave their life to him. But they talked about him, and the prophecies had it. And, and, and even the religious people who were, who were living good lives, but they had walked right by, by Jesus to their traditions, they, were, they did not want to. When, when it was coming, they refused to believe. Well, he can't be from, the, it says the prophet's from, from Bethlehem, and he's from Nazareth. But he's doing all of these things. They didn't want, they had a good gig going, right? And we've got a, good, a lot of us have a good gig going. And I'll tell you something. It's time to get disenfranchised with this prison that you're in called life in the flesh. Amen? I'm going to say that again. It's time to get disenfranchised with it and to start thinking about how much invested you are in what Jesus actually says about what life is all about, which is him. Life is in him. It's not life with him. Life is in him. He is life. He, he doesn't know the truth. He is the truth. He doesn't bring light. He is the light. Right? We have to start bending our will and bending our walk, our walk. In, in Hebrew, you know, they call it, uh, in King James, they call it your conversation, but it really entails everything of your life. Does your life actually, people examine your walk, does it say, I'm looking forward to a kingdom that's not made of hands, right? kingdom built by God, right? So um, that's just, the, once again, I'm just beginning again. And um, how do you talk about the greatness of Jesus? You know, it's a big subject, but I want to start with uh, an, a, a woman named uh, Sophia in April of 2000. 14. Sophia was a young Christian woman in Somalia of Mogadishu. When she had been driving and men saw a cross hanging from her, uh, from her mirror, they pulled her out of the car and they beat her and they uh, shot her several times only because she, they thought she was a Christian. How can that happen? The hatred for Christ is real in this world. And um, we saw it operate a little bit yesterday. And um, it, it's true. And, and we, we have to expect that. Now, 
somewhere along the, the American church wanted, the American Christianity wanted to be loved and embraced by the world. I mean, you're, the pastors now are the coolest people. They're, they're cooler than any of their, their congregation. I mean, they're hip, they're cool. Uh, the music's as good, if not better, than the stuff we used to go uh, drink and do drugs to at, at concerts. It's just that there's no drinking and drugging, but it sure is pretty good music. And, uh, but it's fluffy like cotton candy because people don't want to sing 12 different hymns or 12 different stanzas, right? <laughs> but I, I digress. Nowhere in Christianity do you see the church being loved by the world. You really don't. You see people pulling people out of cars and shooting them and beating them because they suspect they are Christian. Or you see, see, or you, or you see people being persecuted mercilessly just for preaching Christ. And you see it illegal in, in the whole Muslim world. It's illegal. You can't even talk about Christ to people. You'll get killed. But we Christians, you, if you want to talk about Allah, I'd love to talk about Allah with you. I would like to compare Allah with Jesus, and we'll see, and, and Muhammad with Jesus. Let us look at their lives and examine them together. They don't want that. But I, I'm digressing. So, uh, does everybody know who Napoleon Bonaparte is? Okay. So Napoleon Bonaparte was the emperor of Europe. And uh, he had gone all the way to Russia and all of Europe, and it was uh, at the time of the French Revolution. He was exiled to the island of, uh, I think it was Al Alba or Malta or something. But he, what was it? Elba. Elba. And uh, he had written, he had, he had a series of letters. Now, he was not a Christian. In fact, he was a wicked man. But here's what he wrote about Jesus. Uh, he had written to one of his generals from exile. Near the end of his life, it says, the, the exiled emperor Napoleon came to the following conclusion about Jesus. He said, uh, I know men, and I tell you that Jesus Christ was no man. Superficial minds see a resemblance between Christ and the founders of empires and the gods of other religions. That resemblance does not exist. There is between Christianity and all other religions the distance of infinity. Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and myself have founded empires. But on what did we, when what did we rest the creations of our genius and might? Upon sheer force. Jesus Christ alone founded his empire upon love. And at this hour, millions of men will die for him. In every other existence but that of Christ, how many imperfections? From the first day to the last, he is the same. He is majestic and simple, infinitely firm and infinitely gentle. He proposes to our faith a series of mysteries and commands with authority that we should believe them, giving no other reason than the tremendous words, because I say so, I am God. The Bible contains a complete series of acts uh, and of historical men to explain time and eternity, such as no religion has to offer. If it is not the true religion, one is very excusable in being deceived, for everything in it is grand and worthy of God. The more, oh, I just got out. The more I consider the gospel, the more I am assured that there is nothing there which is not beyond the march of events and above the human mind. Even the impious themselves have never dared to deny the sub sublimity and beauty of the gospel, which inspires them with a sort of compulsory veneration and worship. What happiness that book procures for those who believe it. So what I want to say is everything in your life begins with reading and believing the Bible. That's simple. My whole life changed when I, when I decided I was going to believe every word in the Bible. That's when things started to happen for me. And the Lord started opening up things in my life. And I went through some real trials and tribulations, you know. And uh, the Bible actually was the only thing. Once I started to believe the Bible, I first had to believe what it said about me. 
Then, in that desperation, I needed something else to believe in, and it showed me Jesus. And between the Bible telling me the truth about myself and the truth about Jesus, I learned the truth of everything. So here's the truth of everything. The only thing that matters is Jesus. He's the author and finisher of all life. He's the one. If you're looking for anything, he's the one. And, and no matter what, no matter what, if they are about to electrocute you, Jesus is the one. If you're starving to death, Jesus is the one. If you have any, if your friends are tempting you to go out and go drinking with them, Jesus is the one. He's better than that. He can overcome every problem you have. All you got to do is, is hang out with him and give him the honor and, and that he deserves. But here is a God that also wants to be your friend. Here is a king that also wants to be your brother. He commands things of you, and then he empowers you to fulfill those commands. Who else can do that? I remember uh, Jesus showed me his greatness on a snowy road. Here's my good friend again. Hi, Molly. Hi. That's my I'll, I'll hug you afterward, okay? It's always good to see Molly. So I was walking down. I was, I used to, when I was uh, in Upper Peninsula of Michigan. By the way, you know that the Upper Peninsula is mentioned in the Bible? Jesus said, go and preach uh, the gospel to uh, all nations, beginning in Jerusalem and Samaria, and to the uppermost parts, the U.P., that's a, right. Uh, the, other, the uttermost parts, right? The UP. Well, that's the UP, right? The uttermost parts. Right. So anyway, that's, that's always the joke we said. So when I was up, you know, uh, I, had, I had known about Jesus. So Jesus is pursuing you. And he really knows if you're pursuing him. If you start really pursuing Jesus, he will pursue you until he gets you. I always say it's like, you know, people say, when did you find Jesus? Well, it's kind of like the little girl who, is, who goes out in the woods and she gets lost. And she's crying. And then she finds a log and she kind of lays down, you know, to take a nap. And her dad is frantically searching for her, frantically. And he turns a corner and he sees a little, oh, he sees her dress. And he see, by that log, he recognizes the dress. He starts running to her and she hears something. She pops up and she's like, Daddy, Daddy, I found you. Get it? Jesus is looking for you. He sent the hounds of heaven after you. And the hounds of heaven got sent after me. And when they caught me, it was on a snowy road about 9.30 in the evening on a cold January night in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. I always liked, as a, I was on staff at Mission Teens. So listen, I had been in a discipleship center for two years, or about a year and a half. I had gone through all the rigmarole. I was teaching classes, I was doing the right things, and I was loving Jesus. But you know what? I had never really, really had that desperate transaction that we all need to have. And actually, I've had that transaction more and more in my life. This is a, actually, when you hang out with Jesus, do you know that every day you have a desperate transaction? Because you realize how wonderful. The only reason that you're not desperate is because you're not hanging out with Jesus. If you saw how good he is, you realize how desperate your situation is without him. Amen? Does that make sense? Am I making any sense to you? So, so it was Christmas, that's right, it wasn't January, it was Christmas, and I'll tell you why. Well, I used to like to run at night, in the snow, in the dark, up in the UP where the bears and all the, and all the wolves and all, because it gave me like a little, I always thought I was like, cool, okay. I was like, they'd be like, where's Todd going? And I'm like, I'm going out jogging. Well, it's 9.30 at night, yeah, I know. You know there's animals out there, yeah, it's cool. Anyway, so I had my headphones on, and I was listening to A Holy Night. And I was just loving the Lord, and I was by myself, and it was a little snow. I mean, it was beautiful. You, people who've been up there know how beautiful it is. And that, man. Okay, the Holy Spirit just showed up here. I'm telling you. 
Do you expect the Holy Spirit to show up every day? You know, churches are dead because they're not seeing miracles. They're not expecting the Holy Spirit, the big guy. He's the one. He's the one the Father and the Son have given us. The, the Holy Spirit expecting him to show up every time they come to church and they get together. But I expect him to come, and I hope that we can develop a church that expects miracles every time we come. We're not seeking signs and wonders, but wherever the Holy Ghost goes, he leaves a little token of his power in somebody who's expecting. Just read Acts 14, and Paul calls out that guy and says, stand up on those club feet. And he'd been watching Paul, and Paul looked at him and saw that he's expecting. He, he knows the power of God. Stand up! And he stands up, and his feet are healed. Anyway, I digress. My whole life is a digression. As, I, as the words fall on your knees, for hear the angel voices, Somebody hit me from behind, and I fell on the ground in the snow. And the weight of my sin came upon me, and I started to weep. And I wept, and I wept like a baby. I'm telling you, I wept like a two-year-old baby with the weight of my sin. It had hit me. The Holy Spirit had finally showed up in my life. He had tested me to see if I was serious about him. And then when he showed up, there was no one around. And I hit the ground, and I was on my knees. It was the angels. I'm telling you, the angels of God put, drove me down on my knees. And I sat there, and I just started weeping over my sin, over who I was, over how did this happen to me? How could I do this? How could I hurt so many people? How could I be so selfish? How could I be so unaware of how many people I've hurt and how selfish? How could I, how could I have turned my back on the loving God who, is, who give, has given me everything? How could I hurt Jesus? And it just cleansed me. And I got up. I was born again. I was born again. That was an experience. That was dramatic. So when I came back, people, a couple of people were like, Shafe, what's up with you? I was like, you wouldn't get it. I hope you get it. Jesus Christ has the ability to convict you of your sin and tell you all the terrible things about yourself. And at the end of it all, you're so grateful and you're so uplifted because he's the one who's telling you. And he's the one who died for you for that. Do you understand what I'm saying? Who, no one else can do that. Anyone else that tells you bad stuff about yourself, you usually put up a wall. But when Jesus tells you about bad stuff, you come closer to him. He draws you toward himself. No one can do that. That's why you have to make Jesus the most important person in your life. All right, can we go to um, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. All right. So there's so many scriptures. I just want to throw a couple scriptures out at you. And um, let me get my e-sword here. I have a few scriptures I want to... No, I'm going to just do it because people are saying they can't hear. And I told Jameson that when we had... See, if he hadn't made me work yesterday, I would have been more prepared. But he made me work, so I didn't have a chance to go over stuff with him. Um, did you ever read the... Have you ever... Have you, remember I told you to uh, read uh, the, Holy of, the Holiest Place by Andrew Murray? the book of Hebrews, if, if anybody has, a, if you really want to begin studying after you read all four Gospels again, because everybody needs to get familiar with the Gospels like you do, uh, like you know about your favorite song or your favorite movie, okay? I have a couple favorite movies. When I was, uh, unsa when I was not saved, the movie a Caddyshack was my favorite movie. I know every single thing about the movie Caddyshack. Every single thing. I'm not proud of it. It's just the way it is. But the Lord told me, you need to know the Gospels like you know Caddyshack. So, 
that's the supremacy and it's funny because it's funny that they, in my book the uh, chapter one is called the supremacy the supremacy of god's son god who at various times and diverse manners spoke in the past to the fathers by the prophets has now in these days spoken to us by his son whom he has appointed heir of all things and by whom also he made the worlds Okay, we may read over that, but really, I just took a megaton nuclear bomb and threw it right in front, right down your pants, okay? So if you're not exploding right now with that, you, you, haven't, read, you haven't read it. Let's say that again, okay? In the past, God spoke to in various ways, but ever since that ended, he spoke, he's now speaking to us in this way through his son, through whom he appointed the heir, the inheritor of everything, because he made everything. Jesus Christ, and we remember Jameson has been reading Colossians, that beginning of Colossians, right? For all things were made by him, through him, and for him. And there was nothing that was made that was not made through him. All principalities, powers, dominions, everything visible, invisible, things above the world, things below the world. Everything was made for him, through him, and by him. This is why to worship Jesus and to get to know Jesus is the highest thing you can do in your life. Everything else is really utter nonsense. God knows you have to live. I understand that. But even in your living, the Holy Spirit has allowed, because the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, you can be worshiping Jesus, and getting closer to Jesus while you're out cutting trees. You can do it, you can get, be worshiping Jesus while you're cleaning your bathroom. You can be building the fruits of the Spirit. That's the great thing about the kingdom. And also one of the things that's kind of scary is God says, you know, you can, the way that you can build treasures for yourself isn't the way you build treasures in the earth. And the way you build treasures in the earth is you take yourself away, you pour all your energy, everything, into getting this business going or getting money. Then you buy these treasures. Then you take care of them. Then you make sure they're beautiful, you know. So you have to singularly almost separate yourself from life, okay? You know that. People, people that have big empires, I mean, they focus on that empire, right? Sometimes they do it to the, to the ruination of their own families, but Christ says, no, that's not how you build your empire in heaven. You build your empire in heaven by getting to know my son, by getting to know Jesus through the Holy Spirit who's with you all the time and who also can be with you glorifying God while you're doing anything. Whether you're working at a McDonald's counter or whether you're uh, in church here. You can be building up your, for yourself treasures in heaven that, rust and, that moth and rust do not decay. So, um, did we read, and, and here we'll read Hebrews 1.3. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. So, he began, this, he began Hebrews 1 talking about the Lord God, God the Father. And now he's talking about God the Son who is the expressed image of God the Father. If you want to know God and the power of God, then know Jesus, because he is the expressed image of, of Christ. He is the brightness of his glory. Jesus is the only way you're ever going to look at God, this side of eternity, and not have your eyes burned out and die. Okay? He's, who can take the glory of the self-existent supreme God whose pure holiness and righteousness but that you can actually look at and gaze eye to eye at. Only Jesus can do that. You know, when John saw Jesus in heaven in the book of Revelation, now remember, John had his head on Jesus' breast, right? At the Last Supper. John, I think, was only about 17 years old at the time of this, at the time that he walked with Jesus. And he, and he knew Jesus for three and a half years. In fact, he was the only faithful one that actually was at the cross. 
But when he saw Jesus now, remember, I think our first sermon was the Jesus before and the Jesus that's come, that we're going to see next are different. They're the same. But now he's coming in glory. He's coming in judgment. That lamb is now a lion. And John saw him and he, f and he fell dead. He fell as if dead. He just, he was so overwhelmed that he just collapsed. And he walked with Jesus. One of the great things that, one of the reasons I worship Jesus is because his own brother worships him. James, who wrote the book of James, he was Christ's little half-brother. Jesus and James shared Mary as, a, as, as, the, as the mother. Of course, they had different fathers. But what does it take for to convince you that your brother is God? And to worship him, not only that, but to die for him. That testimony. That's the most amazing thing that people, I think, a lot of people don't, in considering Christ. How, what, what would it take for you? We all have siblings, right? What would it take to convince your brothers that you're God to the point that they gladly lay their life down for that fact and lose everything, you know? How about the hardened Roman soldier? You know, those guys, those Romans, I, I, I like to study a lot of stuff and I look at some things, my wife thinks I'm disturbed because I look at, like, the way Romans tortured people just to kind of get an idea of what, or stuff like, just things weird. I don't know why. I'm not, I'm not morbid. But these are things that, like, help me to understand what some of them went through, right? And these guys that crucified people were tough men. They had done it for a living. They were professional professional mean guys. And that Roman soldier who saw the way Jesus died looks up and says, surely he's the son of God in the way that he died. When Peter saw Jesus in the boat after the miracle of the fishes, Jesus, Peter finally sees Jesus. Jesus says, throw it on. And as soon as the miracle happens, he turns to Jesus. What does he do? He begs Jesus to leave him alone because he's a sinful man. He begs him, please depart from me, Lord. I am a wicked man. I live, I've lived a, a sinful life. Please, I can't bear to be with you. And of course, Jesus takes him in, right? When Isaiah saw the Lord. Now, Isaiah is a big time holy guy. So much so that Isaiah would be laughed out of every church in America. First of all, he, he's not cool. Second of all, he probably didn't shave and, and, and bathe that much. And uh, third of all, all he spoke was warning and judgment. And that's not going to bring a lot of people to your uh, fog light show concert. I kid, I'm just kidding. But Isaiah said, woe is me. When Isaiah saw the Lord, he said, woe. In other words, great, immense sorrow is upon me. And he says, I am undone. I'm undone. In other words, every molecule just went to pieces. I'm, I'm no longer, I'm undone. I'm, I'm apart. I have no, I'm not cool. I'm not tough. I'm nothing. I'm done. I'm done. Help me. And the angel takes, he said, I'm a man of unclean lips. God's very specific. You know, when you deal with the Lord, it's funny because, yeah, Isaiah was a sinful man because he was a man. But the Lord will always target one thing at a time, you know. It may be your, it may be your crack smoking, as it was for me. That was the first thing. He's like, okay, I love you. I want to have a relationship with you. You've got to stop smoking crack, and I'm going to help you, okay. Then we'll start there. And that's the way he worked. And he's, now he's worked on other things. Now he's had attitudinal things, which are way harder than stopping smoking crack. You know what I mean? Complaining, right, Jameson? Complaining is just way harder than... Um, the Lord, as I was looking at this, the Lord gave me a great, it just dropped it on me. I always liked Mark chapter 5. So I don't want to read all of it because I want to talk about it. But Mark chapter 5, there are three incidents. 
Remember Napoleon said he, he's infinitely firm and tough and he's infinitely gentle and kind. No one has the right these, these, these great qualities that are opposite qualities in full measure, in fact in infinite measure. Jesus has them all. He's infinitely holy and he's infinitely uh, compassionate to your sinfulness. In that, in, in that he wants to help you. But he's so holy, you don't dare stand in his presence. He's, he's infinitely unbending. But he's infinitely tender in dealing with you. One of the great scriptures is, says, I love it. It says, a bruised reed he will not break. A little, he, a little wisp of, of, a, of an ember he will not blow out. In other words, if you have anything that's interested in him. He will take that and he will work with that. Yet he deserves everything, but he'll take anything you can give him. Who could do that? No one can. So in Mark chapter 5, the Lord was telling me, I just, I, I've given you the whole, John writes about the Bible and it says the whole Bible, if all the books written about Jesus where actually if all the things written about him were penned down, the whole world would not be able to contain it. In other words, uh, if this was a little, if you just filled up the whole world with these, all about Jesus, the whole world still wouldn't be big enough to contain Jesus. But the Lord said, but I'm going to make it easy on you, Todd. Why don't you read Mark chapter 5, and I'll show you how great Jesus is. And so in Mark chapter 5, it begins where Jesus shows up and there was a man, two men actually, and they're possessed by the demons. It's called the famous demoniac of the Gadarenes story. And Jesus shows up, and immediately upon his arrival, there is a man possessed with two, at least 2,000 demons. And he has broken chains and terrorized everybody. He's running around naked. He's a, and immediately... The kingdom of Satan and darkness, they are terrified. They are dreadfully possessed with trepidation and fear upon the Holy One of Israel, who literally just walked up. If you've ever dealt with the demonic realm, I, I want to tell you, they're not afraid of you at all. In fact, the tougher you are, the smarter you think you are, the better they like it. You know that? And these guys were terrified. In fact, that is, upon seeing Jesus, they're like, have you come to have you come before the time and to cast us into everlasting darkness and destruction and hell? They had terrorized everybody in that, in that whole, Gadarenes was 10 cities. They had, they had terror, no one could keep this man under control. He feared nothing. But when they saw Jesus, they were undone. Okay? Who can do that? And if you see the way Jesus talks to him, Jesus never even has to, he doesn't, he doesn't need to fight. He just shows up and speaks, get out. That's it. Out. Please don't, please, when they're begging us, the demons don't beg anybody. They want you to beg. Please, please, let us go somewhere. And they go into the pigs. And even the pigs can't take it. They're smarter than humans. They don't like demons in them. Get a lesson. Learn from the pigs. <laughs> they didn't like it. But then, then, right after that, so I just wanted to say, who strikes terror into the whole kingdom of darkness? Jesus. Just his presence terrifies the terrifying ones. But now we have another, then we, have another, then we go right to the story where you have the woman with the issue of blood and you have Jairus, the very rich synagogue leader. And both of them have something that's 12 years. One, is a, one, you have an outcast woman who is completely bereft of anything. She is, no, she is societally, she is, she's unclean. So she has been rejected from society. She is broke. She's trying to heal something that she could not bear to have for 12 years. For 12 years, she had, 
she had an issue of blood. In that culture, blood made you unclean. So she was completely rejected by everyone. And she had to fight through. But she knew there was a, a, a man that could help her. And so she fought through everything. She had no money. She was a woman in a, in a male-dominated place. She was unclean, and she was bleeding and dying, and there was nobody that could help her. She was bad. She came from a very low place, but she, had, she knew that Jesus could do something. But then there's another, at this very same time, there's a story of a very high man. He's, he's not only a man in a man's world, he's a synagogue leader in, a, in the Jewish religious culture. So he's rich and powerful and wealthy, but he has something that he's had for 12 years he cannot bear to lose. It's, do you think it's a coincidence that her issue of blood was 12 years and Jairus' daughter was 12 years old? 12 and 12? Something about 24 thrones, as thinks the 12 tribes and the 12 apostles. Anyway, but she is, this woman is frightened to come up to Jesus. She's terrified. How could she approach such a, 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 a godly man and, 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 and go through all of, have to break through all these traditions? Jairus is exactly the opposite. How could he humble himself to an itinerant preacher? He's the big guy of the synagogue. He's rich. But in their desperate need, in their desperate need, they both go to Jesus. One from a high place to a low place. One from a low place to a high place. One from riches to the poor preacher. One from destitute to the king of glory. One a woman, one a man. One who can't bear to have something, one who can't bear to lose something. Do you see it? And Jesus is going to deal with each one in a way that they never expected. You see, one thing I wrote here is uh, Jesus never worries about what you think of his method of dealing with stuff. He never yields. If he wants to throw you in prison, he'll throw you in prison if it's good for you. If he wants to put you in a sick bed, Jesus will put you in a sick bed if he knows it's good for you. If he wants to keep you poor, he'll keep you poor. If he wants to make you rich, he'll make you rich. He knows what's good for you. He makes no apologies to anybody. He never compromises, ever. He's uncompromisingly caring and tender and compassionate. You know? And accommodating. He's uncompromisingly accommodating to you. No one can do that. When we compromise, we compromise. When we accommodate, we accommodate. He's both. Unyieldingly malleable to your unique problem. So Jesus comes. Uh, so she wants to come in and get out. She wants to get her healing. And she wants to get out. And he wants Jesus to come to him. So as Jesus is coming to him, is going, that woman stops the whole procession, right? And she touches him. He says, somebody touched me. My virtue went out. And so he stops the whole thing with a huge crowd. Imagine Jairus. Jairus is like, my daughter's dying. You have to come. Why? What are you doing? You're stopping in the middle? Like, we got to get going. You, we got to go. You know, it was bad enough that I have to humble myself to this itinerant preacher from Nazareth to help me because nobody can help. No, my religion can't save her. My, my, my good works can't save her. My richness can't save her. My uh, good morality can't save anything. You got to do it. So come, come. Now you're stopping. Uh, he's probably going, what's he doing? What's he doing, right? And then she's like trying to get in and out. She's trying to do the old dipsy do, right? She's trying to get in, get her healing, and get out. And then all of a sudden, he's like, who touched me? She's like, oh, no, I'm busted. Oh, the worst thing ever happened to me. I'm done. He saw me. He felt me. He says, daughter. Daughter? That's the only time Jesus calls anybody daughter. He always called him woman. Seriously, woman. He called his mother woman. 
He says, daughter, go in peace. Your faith has made you whole. Oh, my gosh. Can you imagine what she did when she walked away? I mean, bleeding was no good, but she got the healing there. But he gave her something extra. What she really needed was to hear the words, daughter, from the Son of God. And everybody, he made sure, everybody heard him call her daughter. In one word, all of her exile, all of her ostracizing, and all of her blackballing was wiped out. And she went from down here to absolute. That's the one Jesus called daughter. Okay? He did it all one more, in one word. And my wife and I can attest to, in one moment, Jesus turned our whole lives around. In one, as I ran down that, down that road, on just a normal, one of my many nighttime runs, in one moment, Jesus born, came into my life, and I was born again. But now we have Jarius, and Jarius takes Jesus, so he, I want to read that part. This is Mark chapter 5, and I think it's verse 39 or, or 40. Uh, Mark 5, and we will start it. Okay. So Mark 38, and he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue. And seeing them in tumult, and they wept and wailed greatly. And when he had come, he said to them, listen to this. It doesn't seem so tender. He says, why, why are you guys all upset? She's not dead. They're, they find out that she's dead. She's died. Jesus is like almost uncaring. He's like, why are you making a big deal? He's, she's not dead. She's sleeping. And they start to mock him, it says. It says, and they laughed him to scorn. But this is verse 40. But when he had put them out, and, and so Jesus, I, lo I love this. Jesus is like, why are you crying? She's not dead. She's sleeping. She's dead. We know death. We live with death. The one thing human beings do know is death, right? And he's like, get out. Get out. Get out. And then he says, and he took the father and the mother of the damsel. Interesting. He's the public guy. And he takes them privately to see his glory. The woman is private, and he shows her his glory publicly. Do you see the difference? Everything, everything got messed up. Oh, okay. Everything uh, Jesus does, he's not doing exactly the way people expect it. They laughed him to score, and he said, uh, they took them with him where she was lying, and he takes her by the hand, and he says, Talitha kumi, which is interpreted in Aramaic that says, little girl, wake up. Now, I did some interesting studies on this. There is a, uh, there is a, oh, guess, in a book called Hastings Dictionary. I just happened to look up this Talitha kumi. But did you know that the word tale means Little farm animal, lamb. So really, uh, according to Hastings Dictionary, which is a really old book, even though even the microfilm of it is shady, he said to her, little lamb, wake up. Is that great? We're the sheep. We're his sheep and the sheep of his pasture, right? And so the king of glory now raises someone from the dead. And he says, just little lamb, wake up. I always loved that story. And you know why I loved it? Is at the end. He says, get her something to eat. <laughs> Who could do that? He just resurrected her, but he understood. Because he's not only the son of God, he's the son of man. And he understands you. And he'll raise you from the dead, and then he'll tell you, go get something to eat, Dwight. I think you're hungry now. Dwight, get some rest. I'm not picking on Dwight. But who could do this but the Son of God? You know, he understands us so well. 
He who raised that little girl from, he who healed, he did the divine thing. He did a supernatural thing with that woman. He healed her. But then what he did was something even greater. He established her and affirmed her as a loving daughter. He raised that girl from the dead. And then he's like, but I know that you are made of dust. Somebody get her something to eat. And he cares for you in that way. That is just a sliver. Just Mark 5. The Lord told me. You can learn everything. You, I'll give you a million point seven five years. Just on Mark 5. And you come back to me and tell me. In eternity. We'll talk more about it. Do you see how beautiful Jesus is? In these times, brothers and sisters, when you're going to pray, you're going to have to pray to someone who's very dear to your heart, and he's going to help you. My son and I have seen miracles. We prayed for his throat. His throat got healed. You know what? I expect the man who said, get her something to eat, and raise, after raising her from the dead, that he's going to heal me of things, that he's going to protect me from the evil one, that he's going to carry me all the way to heaven. And I just have to make the most of him. And you know, if I can get that little bit just from Mark 5, what can we get if we make it our life's journey to become experts in Jesus, right? Amen? So, Father, we just thank you in Jesus' name. I praise you, God. I praise you, Jesus. Lord, I could talk about you forever and ever and ever, and I can't wait to do it when nobody will get sick of it because I'll be with people who want to out-talk me about Jesus, and all we want to do is talk about it. Jesus and be with Jesus and make the most of Jesus because if I believe the Bible, Father, I thank you for your word. And if I really believe the Bible, then I must make the most of your son. And that just makes sense to me. So I praise you, Lord. Uh, we're going to play music. We're gonna, we are going to wrap this up, Adam. So uh, if you know the Lord and it's a big deal to you and you have examined your heart, come up and take some uh, communion. But it's not a small thing. I want only those who are real believers, born again, and know what they're doing. Next week, we're going to have a nice discussion about it. But uh, we just want to make it available. And we're going to play one last song. And if anybody wants prayer, I have two oil, I have two bottles of anointing oil, one from Israel and one from California. For bold soldiers of Christ. And, okay, okay, thank you.